Hello, and thank you for joining us for what is sure to be an informative webinar on understanding MT quality beyond the blue. Now, I wanted to introduce our speakers and go over some housekeeping before I turn this presentation over to our presenters. So I'm Jane Hendricks. I'm with SEL, and with us today is Kurti Vashi and Dr. Pete Smith. Now, Curdy is a language technology evangelist at SDL, and Dr. Pete Smith is with the University of Texas at Austin. Curdy is an industry innovator, and before SDL was a consultant who focused on machine translation and language technology. He has long-term sales and marketing experience in the enterprise software industry, and he's worked at large global organizations and a number of successful startups. He is a frequent blogger, speaker, and advisor for all aspects of machine translation and just advanced linguistic technology in general. Dr. Pete Smith is a Chief Analytics Officer with the University of Texas. He co-founded the Learning Innovation with Network Knowledge Lab. Um, it's a learning analytics research laboratory with national and international visibility. He serves as the program head for UTA's Localization and Translation Certificate Cert, yep, and conducts research in the field of natural language understanding, NLU. So he has an absolutely impressive background. Now this webinar is being recorded. We will make the recording and the slides available to all of you. And we will have a live Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. So as we go through the webinar, there is a question uh, tab that you'll see over on your right-hand side. Please submit your questions just as they come to you, and then at the end, we will do the live Q&A with our participants, and we will try to get as many of your questions answered as we possibly can. Those that we can't answer live within the time permitted, we will follow up with you one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So again, thank you so much for attending. I really hope you enjoyed this webinar, and I'm going to turn this over to our presenters. Curdy? Thank you very much. So good morning, good afternoon. Good evening, and thank you for joining us today. We live today in an era where there's large amounts of data flowing all the time across the digital networks that we're all connected into. And increasingly, these, these data flows are becoming multilingual. And some of you may be surprised to see that the reality of the use of machine translation today exceeds over a trillion words a day. Very small amount of that is related to localization. Much of it is related to generic public empty portal use. So there's millions of users out there and some very large high volume enterprise use cases. So for example, the e-commerce site in China, Alibaba alone is over 200 billion words a day. And this there, there is now an increasing imperative for organized, large or global organizations to use machine translation technology to, to communicate and to listen and to interact more actively in multilingual forums. And so this two questions come up. You know, the one is, what is the best empty technology solution for me to use? And is it good enough to use for specific use cases? So today what we'll do is we'll cover some of the methodology, some of the approaches used on how do we understand what is the best empty technology and look at a few use cases to understand this better. So there's two primary ways that machine translation is evaluated. The most reliable, most um, accurate way is to have human beings look at machine translation output and and give you some sort of assessment, a rating. The problem with that is it's slow, expensive, and it's inconsistent. So when you show machine translation output to human beings, some are very hard graders and some are not so hard. And so you never sure, it's, it's more difficult to be sure what it really means, but it is still the gold standard. There is an increasing number of automated metrics that I use that you know, are rough approximations. They're not really true translation quality indicators, but they're useful to make quick and dirty assessments. And it's worth taking a look at the blue score. And this is 
this is something that has been used in the machine translation industry in the last 15 years with great uh, frequency and is in most discussions among researchers you will find that references made to blue scores and you know showing improvements in blue scores as a way to show progress or decreases in blue scores as a way to show that the, the strategies that they're trying are not working so it is most frequently used in the mt research community the people who build engines the people who are researching new algorithms people who are looking at new kinds of data formulations to see what impact it has and as i said it's a quick and dirty output quality measure but blue only measures text string similarity and i will give you some examples of what that means so it does it's not really an assessment of the quality of the of the translation it is just showing you that it matched some reference that we have and blue in itself has no intrinsic meaning and it's really we should be very clear right from now and i will say this several times it is not a measure of translation quality and blue and others measurements like it all use this basic approach of matching text strings between a reference human translation and a machine translation sometimes they they have more than one human translation so you get some variance but in most cases the costs prohibit that and so we are most frequently looking at one human translation compared to a machine translation and essentially what a blue score is is the percentage of empty output ngrams which are text string clusters that can be found in a reference translation so for example in this example right here we see airport and it is both in the machine translation and in the human reference translation so you get points for that and generally what you're looking for is to get as many matches as possible and getting 2 3 forward matches is even better so the reason it has been used from the outset of statistical machine translation particularly is because they found that initially that blue matches human judgment so when we look at human measurements of adequacy and fluency and you look at the blue scores on that you saw that there was actually a pretty good correlation so that it made sense to use them but as the mt output has improved over time you know as we've gone from to phrase based statistical to neural machine translation we find that often the the alignment between human judgments and the blue scores are less and less accurate and so especially with the neural machine translation we're finding that this is not as often true so now one of the reasons for this problem is that any given source sentence can have many different translations so here's an example of a chinese source sentence and 10 acceptable translations for it you know they're all technically correct but in in a blue score scoring mechanism you can really only use one or two of them you know the nist for a while used four but that is as extensive a set as has ever been used in the in the industry so in most cases we're looking at only one of these can be technically correct and so what happens then is that many other sentences which are also good matches tend to be scored much lower even though in terms of the business assessment in terms of even the human translator assessment two or three or four of these sentences might be viable and so here you see the more red you see on this on the sentence the lower the score is and the more green you see and the more the turquoise the uh, colors you see the better it is so the as you can see that there are two or three sentences that could work but only one will get a very high blue score and and this is one of the problems of 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 bl using blue scores as a way to measure here's a more clear example where you have very good translations that get very low blue scores so like in the first sentence it's completely accurate in terms of its translation but because it does not match the reference translation we're using to calculate the blue score you see that 
you see lots of red in that sentence, and it means it will get a very low score. And since the only words that are matching there are the, it's going to get a very, it will be punished as well, you know, for in, in the calculations. So this is one very basic problem with machine translation, with using blue scores to measure machine translation quality, because many accurate, correct translations will score lower simply because they use different words. Um, it's important to understand that when you're using blue, there are some very specific protocols that you need to follow to get a meaningful indicator because even as a text string reference indicator, it is only as it can only be good if it's done right. And the most serious problem most often made is that the test set is like an exam that a student takes in, you know, in at school and university. It should be something that the student has not seen before and that it should and it should not be included in the training material. Otherwise you're just it's like giving the student the exam before they actually write the test and so it's, it will give you a meaninglessly high score and that will not be validated when you start to see actual new data that the engine has not seen before. So one of the key requirements is that it needs to be blind. Um, the most common problems we see with blue-based comparisons and, and I, when I say blue I mean many other text-based references that attempt to measure you know, what we call precision and recall um, between a human reference and the machine translation output is that they most often use news domain from publicly available sources like the w WMT data sets. So this is a research community that makes a lot of data available to many machine translation vendors and this is used for them to assess you know the state of the art, the state of you know whose technology is a little bit better or not and at the time it's done it's it is blind, so it's useful. But when, you know, when we when we're using WMT data years later, it's not blind, and so it's kind of meaningless. There is also we many researchers have noted that there's bias introduced by using other MT systems, public MT systems, to edit and create the the, the systems. And we should remember that any measurement is just is like a photograph. You know, a photograph doesn't tell you the overall performance of an athlete, for example, you know, even if it's a, if he has a stunning move, you need to see them in motion. You need to see how it evolves. You need to see how they handle different kinds of problems. And, and this is the same issue with any of these metrics. So there are some other metrics being used that are better than blue. And the most popular ones today are Meteor and LiPo that address some of the deficiencies of Blue, but they're still text reference based solutions and they still have the same basic problems. They all attempt to measure precision and recall and they use different calculations. They use sometimes richer data sets, but they all have the same basic problem. Um, many buyers are looking for just a single measure to see is there a way I can just tell who is better and who's the best one? But the truth is that it's much more, the problem, the challenge of assessment is much more complex than that. And the danger of using a single measure is that it summarizes very complex performance characteristics in ways that are almost always inadequate. So it sh these things should be used with some care. And so they're very useful to researchers and to the people building the engines because they are typically adding new data, they're attempting to use different algorithms, they're trying different kinds of strategies as they modify empty systems because empty systems are living things. They evolve and they change with the steering that is applied to the development phase. And so they're very useful for the people that are working on the machine systems, but they're not as useful for coming to any kind of conclusion that, oh, this empty system is better than that one because of a test we did based on news data that is everyone has seen now, and so who knows if it's in the training or not. But it's important that anyone, any use of this kind of metric should have, users should need have at least a basic understanding of how it works 
and should understand its flaws and limitations as well. So if we now go back to the larger context, you know, we are living in a world where now we see that enterprises are being told that you need to be aware of this thing called digital transformation. And customers today are now interacting with, with global enterprises only in the digital field many times. You know, the, you, the customer may go from beginning to end in terms of learning about a product, deciding which one they're going to buy, and then buying it, and then dealing with the post-sale interactions with the company, but with never talking to a salesperson. All the interactions with, are with content. And so this creates a lot of pressure on organizations to make more content available because content is most often your best salesperson. And this also means that we start now wandering into areas where millions and hundreds of millions of words need to be translated every day, something way beyond the scope of most localization teams. And it's important to understand what happens when you don't do this properly. So here's, you know, we use the CX is a term we use to ex describe cust customer experience. So in, an inter in the journey that a customer has with the organization, you know, from the time they research the product to the time they purchase, to initial service and support interactions, and to the point where they upgrade to a new model or not, you see that even if a customer has a 90% satisfaction rating on each one of those individual steps, the, the actual impact over the whole journey is that they're down to 66%. And that that is, by many marketing measurement metrics, it is a sign that they're sort of indifferent to that product. They would switch easily. And so this is a problem. So that content which feeds these customers needs to be always available. And, and now with a web that has 5 billion users on it, it needs to be multilingual all the time. And we need fast flowing multilingual co content that is useful and re relevant for customers all through this journey. So empty, the value to the global enterprise is that it makes all content instantly multilingual. And as we see from the stats on the use of machine translation in the world today, millions and hundreds of millions of people are translating many, many pages a day. In even, and most often they're doing it in public, public empty portals where there's no security. So there is a need for global enterprises to build empty solutions that are proprietary, that are private, that are secure, and that enable them to listen to their customers, communicate more actively, collaborate within global teams, you know, share more information, and also work with more partners to co-create new, new content. And, and, th and so this brings us to a closer look at some of the enterprise use cases. You know, that originally machine translation was only used in the localization areas, but now it is increasingly used in other very high volume kinds of um, enterprise use cases. And it's important to understand right from the outset that what are the key differences between localization and some of these other use cases. In localization, we tend to be dealing with much smaller volumes. Um, and so the focus on getting empty quality to as high a level as possible, to as close to human as possible is very important because post-editing is almost always done on localization content. But when you're dealing with consumer experience, communication, collaboration, e-discovery, you're dealing with tens or hundreds of millions of words a day. Um, the, there's more money behind these initiatives, but there's limited or no post-editing possible because the sheer volume completely eliminates that possibility. And so you have this, this initial consideration to have. And what we look for in the broader use of machine translation is that does it really improve the customer's digital experience? We need to understand that when we make certain content that is understandable, that's far from 
perfect human translation, but it enables a customer to quickly get access to some critical piece of data they want while they're engaged in this digital journey with the enterprise. And this, so this changes the way we need to, to look at you know, what we're doing. You know, it, it changes what we translate it changes why we translate it because a lot of this information may only be valid for a day or two. You know, it may be related to some social event, to, to some celebrity, expo, you know, um, endorsement or something that just is momentary and, and you want to maximize that impact of that across the world, but it does not become the kind of thing that you want to do the, the full localization process over. So, I think it's, it is good to say that the empty quality discussion needs to evolve now. It needs to go beyond focused on linguistic per perfection. It needs to go beyond talking about blue and LIPO scores. And it needs to move far beyond the how close is it to human translation. Yes, we all understand that machine translation is not human translation. And... Many people in the AI community will tell you that machine translation is one of the most difficult artificial intelligence problems available to man because it, language is so inherently human, it's so flexible, so very varied. There is the ability for computers to predict, and computers like things to be binary, to make accurate predictions, yes or no, and human language doesn't have that. So the quality discussion we believe needs to evolve, it needs to measure the impact on business value. It needs to clearly suggest that we are improving digital interactions and to speed up the this rate at which we communicate. So some examples is that we improve conversion rates in e-commerce by putting up uh, you know, a million new catalog items in German and French we suddenly see German and French sales improve, even though we know that it's, it, it, the machine translation quality is not human level and it's, it's, it's been done very quickly. So the, the, the metrics that matter are going to be related to the, to the specific use case. And in pretty much the underlying factors there are going to be mostly about speed and agility about access and breadth, make much more content accessible, make it much deeper, and make it much more interactive because we're, there's also a listening and communication aspect to content that organizations are distributing in today. So let's take a look at some of the use cases. And here's one where we focus on communication and collaboration. So where can MT be used in the enterprise? It can, you can focus on customer support content, global teams sharing information about product design, about new business strategies, listening to what customers are saying in social media and you know, what the opinion and the image of the brand is. Can just everyday email, chat, communication, and all the reports we produce every day, you know, that's the kind of content that is being translated. And the measures of success in this use case are going to be quite different. You know, it, it will be some indicators of success will be things like huge increases in volume, you know, ensured security around the discussion. So if we're talking about designing a new uh, game station or we're designing new products, those kinds of discussions can happen between global team members and some customers in a secure way. It's better monitoring and understanding of global customers. You know, so just having very accurate senses that this is what we did and this is how the customers feel about it or that this is what the customers are saying about it based on these following 5 million data points. And in general, to make the customer and partner communication much more accurate. So the indicators of success, the measures of empty quality, here are going to be understandability, being correct on critical business terminology, speed and integration within all the infrastructure that is used to look at your customers, to share information with your customers, 
and to listen to what they're saying. And also very critical in this context is data secure, security and privacy because you may be sharing plans and strategies that are very um, confidential and you know very highly confidential. In the localization scenario, and this is the one that most people are aware of, the primary focus is on did we get the work done faster and cheaper? So the most clear indicators of success here are productivity improvements, you know, so which result in lower costs and faster turnaround. And very often this is related to um, higher machine translation quality because higher machine translation quality results in faster turnaround. And in, you know, as a matter of fact, that leads to lower cost. And in this area, there's, there's something that a measure that is very useful where you take a set of uh, sentences and you look at the effort made to convert that, you know, the machine translation output to final post-edited output and something called, called edit distance is often used to do this. But, you know, what we need to understand is that MT is not a static um, kind of technology. It is continually being um, modified and can change. And that what really matters is that how does it perform on your quality? Uh, how does it f perform on your specific subject and, and domain, domain content so that, you know, we don't really care whether you know, one empty system is better on news content over another. What really matters is that how is it performing on your content? And, you know, this is one of the things that people talk about in terms of uh, a use case where uh, how would you measure that? Um, the other thing we need to understand is that in, in the localization use case, MT is not a static um, system. It is continually improving and it improves based on the ability of the system to take feedback, to incorporate feedback, to adjust and modify itself with the, the quality, feed, the corrective feedback it's given in. So the faster that system does it, and the more easily that can be done, the more powerful and more useful it is, even for the localization use case. So even though you may have three systems that rank in a certain way based on news content, in the, at stage one of this, of this process, the picture can be very different. Some systems lend themselves to modification much more uh, easily than others. And so, again, you know, just summarizing, for empty quality and localization is about faster turnaround. It's about lower cost production, about a better empty post-editing experience. And the things that drive this are adaptability and continuous improvement. Um, Let's also now talk about customer service, customer support. This is an area where very huge volumes of content are shared and made available to customers to solve problems that they have. And, you know, we see that more and more of these interactions are now happening across different kinds of digital devices and uh, use email and chat as the primary means of communication. So in this context and in this kind of a use case, what matters? And I think the most important one most companies will agree to is that did it help, did the content we had, did the content we translated help the customer solve a problem they had in using our products? So really the key metrics, the key quality measures here is the content available faster around the world. Is it easily found? And when it is found, is it useful? So. It can, also, it can also mean, can we make existing resources more productive? So, for example, customers around the world type questions in their own language. You can have an English-speaking live agent who will listen to these questions through machine translation and will be able to respond to these different speak, different, uh, to different customers who speak different languages by using machine translation. So the most frequently asked questions, you have canned answers ready. So really the, the trick is to un understand the question. And for more obscure 
questions, they may put to, pull together some content from an existing knowledge base and translate it immediately just to make it possible for a customer to move forward with whatever problem they have. And so the quality indicators here, is MT good enough for the live age to understand the problem the customer has? Is MT good enough for the customer to understand the answer the live agent gave? And really, at the end of the day, is the customer experience improved by this facility, by this making this available? Now, here's an example from data presented by Microsoft um, at a recent gala, uh, a recent gala conference. And what it shows is that there's two things that they measure to understand success rate. And that the two th the things are, was the information relevant? Did this information solve your problem? And then they show you what the, the, the green arrow points to what the, the, the ranking for English is. And then it shows you how different languages perform. And it also shows you the dark line is machine translation. The light green line is human translation. And so you see that in some cases, the, both the machine translation and the, the human translation ranks above English so that some, in some communities, the content is found much more valuable. Um, it, it shows you that the, the, the other the metric that I can't show you on the same graph is that in most cases, more than 90% of the content is machine translated because there's so much of it. You know, at Microsoft, every two or three minutes, there is a new tech note being written by someone in customer support based on questions that are being asked to them in, in most often in English. And so once those notes are made available, they're immediately translated into these different languages. But you see that, you know, Japanese has relatively low satisfaction you know, like it, success rates. And even though, um, you know, in that same presentation, they, you know, Chris pointed out that there was a very high amount of human translation in that context. So it's, it's that machine translation is accepted more easily by some, some like, you know, some customer sets than others. And it, it, it should be, you know, these are the things that should define what your strategy is rather than, looking at a, at a blue score. So again, to summarize, empty quality discussion in, um, in customer service and support is really about higher volumes of successful self-service, ease and speed for often all new support content to be made available. And you know, the way they measure this is most often something called customer satisfaction or just how fast a customer is able to solve problems. So what we see is that the highest ROI and best global outcomes are in much higher volume kinds of applications like sharing knowledge bases, internal co collaboration, customer support, e-discovery, um, secure email, social media analysis. And, you know, before I hand this over to Pete, I want to just quickly touch upon how do MT engines really improve? Because this is more important than understanding what the score was on one day in last summer. Um, it's, it's important to understand that is there continuous improvement in the core technology? So you want to work with vendors that have continuous research driving the technology forward. Is there more better data that can be added to tune it for your specific use? Is there, the, the process innovation is often overlooked in, by many of these kinds of evaluations. Um, it matters how you link the different elements together. You know, when you create content, is the content properly standardized before it goes to machine translation? And then after it's machine translated, is there a feedback process to ensure that this evolves faster? Process innovation may often be the, the most useful place to where machine translation engines improve. And in all cases, human feedback and your ability to garner and collect and organize and submit it back to the learning process is a very key and critical requirement. So the machine translation output quality discussion is really a very dynamic and evolving kind of flux. 
It matters about data, algorithms, process, how well you integrate, how well the workflows are set up, how well you collect human feedback, and finally, really, business value. Um, so in localization settings, we work on small words and we fix every single sentence. You know, so it's a, there is this post-editing mindset. But when you're dealing with millions and hundreds of millions of words a day, you have to look at large corpus. You have to look at trends in very large volumes of data. And you have to work around linguistic patterns and address them at that level. Um, and, and again, so the target quality can vary for it to add, add business value. And sometimes, you know, improvements of 10, 20% in blue score or, or you know, uh, even having blue scores that are 10, 20% lower has min no impact on the actual business value and business outcome. So the quality focus needs to be linked to the business purpose. And um, people talk about some research he's doing to help um, educate the community about this. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm delighted to join you from the Dallas-Fort Worth area and the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, picking up on several of the themes that Curdy uh, has uh, started us out with, um, as researchers, we are very interested in how to continue the development of this discussion about machine translation and its evolution and how we take evaluation into some new areas that are better linked to business purpose or business value or issues of domain. And one of the research teams at the University of Texas at Arlington is working primarily on this problem. In addition to some of the elements that Curdy has noted so far, we have begun to add into the mix the notion of domain-specific test sets. And the idea being that human scoring uh, and automated scoring are both important elements and are used in a wide variety of different settings and focuses. The small research group that has formed around this question, which I would note is primarily drawn from students and graduate students in our localization track here at UTA, uh, who have a very strong um, computational linguistic focus, that group has really begun to think about how bespoke test sets might be added into this discussion. We are not if you will, walking away from all of the automated scoring possibilities, and we'll certainly continue to, to work in that area. Uh, we are not embracing or walking away from either human scoring of test material at the evaluation stage for machine translation, but really thinking about how specific test sets may allow us to improve the complexity of our uh, understanding of how a machine translation engine is performing. We actually were tasked with one of uh, Curdy's um, business cases, as he's outlined it. And we were particularly interested in the internal and external communication and collaboration uh, test case, which Curdy just reviewed. Uh, what sorts of language, what sorts of strings are involved in large enterprises and their internal communications? Uh, how do they monitor and understand global customers? How do they engage with customers who are having problems? And at the business value stage, how do those enterprises through machine translation begin to solve customer problems, resulting hopefully uh, in, in customer satisfaction? And so the research group, um, the student research group, has begun to work uh, by selecting some initial corpora in the areas uh, that I've just outlined. And you will notice it's a little bit of a Frankenstein of a corpus in that there's a variety of different types of language and language with different business purposes. Um, but certainly we wanted to look at email communications within the enterprise. Uh, communications with customers, such as during online chat or social media or other sorts of online customer support. We wanted to look at collaboration in the enterprise, what happens behind the scenes around customer support. Uh, 
And this group has built a small corpora um, around these key areas and has also then developed a test set that can be used specifically against machine translations um, in this particular domain area. Uh, I apologize for the somewhat small text on your screen, um, but one of the most exciting ways that this research group approached the topic was rather than reaching into the corpora and simply extracting a thousand sentences randomly, um, as would be more of a standard approach to evaluation uh, to, to hold back or randomly select sentences from uh, the data on which the machine translation engine was originally trained, this group is developing a bespoke test set, a test set that we are hoping is not a test paper, as to use Curdy's metaphor, uh, that the student has already seen, that the machine translation engine has already trained on. We also put their computational linguistic and NLP skills to good use, asking them to use best practices in corpus selection um, technologies. And you will notice that one of the things we did in selecting strings for the test set was to take the assembled hundreds of thousands of strings and cluster them uh, both semantically and linguistically. We were obviously looking for test screen, uh, strings or sentences that broadly expressed the entire corpus at the semantic level, touched on topics and ideas that we would see across that corpus, but also a test set that was representative linguistically of the broader corpora. Uh, sentence length plays a huge issue, as many of you know, in machine translation. Does our test set accurately represent that domain, whether short sentence are more prevalent or longer strings may be more present as well. How many of those strings might include numbers or special punctuation, email addresses or URLs or vocabulary challenges? Um, how many lemmas or word roots, for lack of a better term, are included in given sentences? And so as you can see through a fairly deep linguistic analysis of the strings in the original corpus, we then selected a uh, test set that we believe is both semantically and linguistically representative of a very specific domain, in this case collaboration and communication at the enterprise level. As we move forward, we are mixing that bespoke test set with human raters as well as with automatic raters. We're really entering into the mix not by throwing away the existing approaches, but by thinking about new ways to get complex looks at machine translation output. That it's no longer enough simply to say the blue score is 31.1 and another engine is putting out 31.2. We're adding these notions of domain and more richer, more complex views of machine translation output, in particular tied to business purpose and tied to business value. I was delighted uh, that Curdy uses the phrase linguistic steering um, as a faculty member and group of students that's very linguistically based rather than engineering based. Uh, we feel we're bringing unique value to this evaluation discussion uh, from the linguistic side of the house in particular and are uh, delighted to do that. One last point I would make, if some of this corpus building uh, sounds very familiar to you, uh, it may, especially if you were on the Taos webinar yesterday, uh, where that large international organization, which is very focused on data for machine translation, has begun also to think about how to use NLP and automation to specifically construct customer-centered uh, or domain-specific training data sets. And I was very pleased to say that many of the approaches we took on the linguistic side, on the NLP side, uh, paralleled some of the work they were doing. They are working at the training data stage. Uh, we are looking at the evaluation stage of the MT process. Um, but I was, as I said, uh, especially excited to see that many of these same, more NLP-intensive approaches are being used in both of our processes. And, Curdy, I will pass it back to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, here's, some, here's an example you forgot to show them. 
Ah. The kind of uh, the kind of communications yes. that you you have. Yeah. One of the challenges of support and customer support and voice of the customer, as many folks listening to this webcast will know, is uh, the notion of tone. Uh, and I'm specifically using tone here as a linguist rather than sentiment to express the idea of emotionally laden uh, expressions or words. And so as we looked through and worked with starting corpora, especially of customer chat uh, or interaction with customers on um, social media uh, platforms, you will notice a wide variety of things and a wide variety of emotive states uh, in that. Um, in addition to just plain uh, colorful language, uh, such as the first example shows, um, notions of sarcasm or other ways to express customer dissatisfaction. Those late in the day deliveries seem to go, quote, missing, unquote, a lot. Um, a particular challenge on a number of levels for a machine translation engine, but we would argue that the emotive content here or the use of a particular uh, sarcastic or other um, strategy by the customer uh, is a particular challenge. Colloquial language, of course. Uh, how are you going to take care of that dude? Um, as well as uh, clever uses of a wide variety of other strategies, I would point out the very last uh, constructed hashtag on the list, hashtag how do you stay in business. Um, really providing challenges from that customer journey portion of the communication and collaboration um, spectrum. Um, we are finding in our research that, in fact, as many of uh, the providers of machine translation throughout the world have discovered, is that there are special challenges with that colloquial and voice of the customer, in particular uh, some of the elements that you can see on the slide here. We may very well at a later stage pull out the more formal internal uh, email sorts of language that one might expect linguistically and semantically and separate that out from the much uh, more Wild West approach one finds in, in some voice of the customer interactions. And so uh, clearly some uh, interesting linguistic challenges to come as we continue this work. And then I'll pass it over to you, Curdy. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to close very quickly here so we have a few minutes left for questions. Is that SDL is focused on critical enterprise themes. So when in our focus of machine translation, we are not focused on winning news-related competitions. We're focused on what matters to the enterprise. You know, how do you really reduce lower, reduce the total cost of ownership? How do you make NMT engines run on cheaper hardware? How do you make it work in completely private settings where we never see the data that you can even train on site if you need to? How do we make the engines rapidly adaptable? These are the kinds of things that we're focused on. And there's an ongoing focus on quality improvements that relate to NMT, very special NMT issues and problems that neural machine translation has adding new languages that matter in the commercial context, you know, that matter, you know, to specific kinds of use cases, new kinds of trade patterns and, you know, new language combinations that never existed before, optimizing quality and speed, and providing a range of different kinds of adaptation possibilities to the enterprise customers so that there are things that they can do, there are things that we help them do, both at the engineering, MT engine level, and at linguistic steering levels with human things, you know, and ultimately to just help you provide control over your data, control over the deep integration into your IT infrastructure, and to allow you to be engaged in the quality evolution process. And most, the innovation that we provide is to have machine learning through the entire content management process, all the way from creation and management of content to organization, ontologies, et cetera, to the translation, to the distribution. We have, we have um, products focused on various aspects of this whole chain, and so we have a unique offering in that we're the only MT provider that does this across the thing. So I want to now just close with this, the formal slide presentation and see if we have any questions.
Hi. Yes, actually, we do have a question. So there is a really nice question from the audience um, that's been here for a while. And hi, this is Jane. I'm back. And please submit your questions. We have about nine minutes or so, and we want to make sure that we get as many questions answered as we possibly can. <clears throat> so the first one is um, the terminology consistency in MT. So the question is that uh, the experience is that MT uses different terms for the same words, and there's not a lot of consistency, whereas the human translation process guarantees consistency. So I'm hoping, Cody, you and uh, the professor can address that. Yeah, uh, the terminolo terminology consistency is a special challenge in neural machine translation. And, you know, there are several ways that you can achieve it. You know, it, it involves analysis of source corpus to look at the number of different ways the same thing is said. So when you understand, you know, that relational database management or RDBMS and database and, you know, the five different ways that you might say it, mean the same thing, then there are ways to say that, okay, in every case, you know, we will, we build equivalencies. And so it can be managed. You know, that, that is something you might do in a localization scenario or where there's, where the precision really matters. But there sometimes you want the engine to be able to have some understanding of using a different term based on the context. So, um, it's a complicated problem, and it's one that c continues to be a challenge to the research and the, you know, the MT practitioners. And you know, for SDL, it is one of the most critical things because remember, we also have over 1,200 internal translators who use machine translation regularly, and we get feedback from them all the time on. These are things we need to control. These are things we want control over. And so, can you provide some ability for that? So, uh, and actually, I really yeah. Your yeah, let's go ahead. I was going to say, and to answer the second part of that sentence, typically consistency is seen as a greater challenge with humans. Um, humans being messy users of language over time, uh, and in many of the contexts, for example, that Curdy was describing, humans at multiple locations with differing backgrounds and differing experiences and differing approaches to content. Um, it's the automated approaches that Curdy was discussing that we think have great great promise in the future. Uh, actually, human consistency, I would argue, is perhaps the greater challenge. Good points. Um, another good question. Uh, any interesting technologies out there for optimizing the quality of the input text? Uh, there are, you know, th there are these uh, technologies that simplify English or simplify the source language and remove the most common problems, you know, spelling errors, etc. So, which we have, we have, for example, in uh, our work with government agencies, we have developed. SDL has developed technology to take um, Arab, there's a language called Arabizi, which is English Twitter Arabic. And it does not translate well in any empty solution without very special efforts. And so it requires special engineering, it requires special corpus analysis. But yes, it, Depending on the business use case, and if you can justify the effort expense, and you have data to allow some examination and exploration, these are problems that can be solved. And so, you know, I there is no single technology I know that just fixes source code. You know, you know, a source text. You know, if that were the case, then everything we'd see on the web would be wonderful. You know, there there are more and more tools now. AI will come and make be used more frequently in source creation. And so then it starts there. You know, there are some information engineering products that attempt to make sure that the source is as good as possible right from the creation phase. And that facilitates translation through, you know, it, it facilitates every interaction of that sentence, that content, through every other transformation it might go through. Great. Um, a couple other questions. Uh, so we talked about uh, uh, measuring quality in a specific instance. So how would we measure quality for, say, customer support? 
Well, the, the, you know, some of the large IT firms who have global customer, you know, customers who are interacting with content on a very regular basis provide many clues, you know, for example, the, the Microsoft data that I showed, where mm -hmm. you're measuring was the data useful, was did the data solve your problem? And so the way that they um, assess that is, you know, that you have um, a reference point with, we wrote this originally in English. What is the success rate in English? And if in English, the success rate is 60%, and you get six, close to 60% on the machine translated output, or even better, as we saw with Chinese and a few other languages, it Italian, then you know that, okay, this, we have, we have gotten the c content to a level that it is useful. And really, th that is the, you have to test the content with customers out. You put translations out on a few, um, uh, you know, most frequently you viewed kinds of questions. And then you monitor, like, what is the impact on the customer's experience? You know, how, what kind of feedback are we getting when we show them? So it's a, it is an interactive process. It's a process of watching and listening. So you create something, you, you know that you have, 10 million words to translate. There's no possibility of complete post editing. So you do the best you can by this linguistic steering process, and then you make content available and you test and watch and modify. It's, it's an evolutionary process. Okay. Um, and one last one, I think we have time for one question. So what might be important when you're translating social media content? Well, in social media, I think, it, as uh, um, Pete pointed out, that social media is a place where people people don't go to social media just to say humdrum things. They either have positive or negative implications on most of the comments they make. You know, it's and it's important for a brand. It's important for a global enterprise to understand all the really positive ones and all the really negative ones, because these are the things that affect the value of your brand that affect your global um, brand image. And so uh, particularly it's very useful for product people and for customer support people to understand what gets customers most upset. And social media is very valuable in that, you know, there's lots of standardization. You know, as I said, we did this project with the, with this Arabic, basically it was terrorist Twitter. And we managed to find out what's positive, what's negative. You know, when they're talking about certain things, we were able to identify customer sentiment from it. And this is a very valuable way of listening. So rather than just listen to dual string translations of the text, you're saying that, okay, this probably is a negative connotation. And as you, you, as you, after you translate a million tweets, you will tend to see four or five major themes. And so that gives you insight to be able to change certain product strategies or certain product issues, or even maybe educational issues that you can, it gives you strategies to counter and improve the overall status of your brand. And so, you know, the coupling of translation with other kinds of analysis, I think is an important element. And normalizing, standardizing social media content because it tends to be messy, it tends to be lots of spelling errors, so you have to weed through that. And there are special things you need to do with MT to make that happen. And, you know, that can only happen with someone who is focused and specialized on enterprise MT problems. Great. Uh, so we are at the top of the hour, so um, we'll follow up with anyone uh, who has questions that haven't been answered yet. Thank you so much for attending this webinar, um, and we will talk to you soon. Bye.